I'm Tommaso Poggio, of course, did not change. <laughs> um, uh, what we had to change, unfortunately for the sad events happening in Israel right now, is that Amnon Sashua was uh, in the panel cannot attend because they are in a state of war right there. And uh, Pietro Perona has been so gracious to accept to jump in at the last moment. So he will replace Amnon. So there will be three of us uh, in real and three virtual. And uh, I don't want to spend too much time in, uh, at this point, I think that we have a fantastic panel I think will be very interesting to ask uh, all of the panelists about their opinion on various topics, including some that we have discussed already. Uh, the questions I want to address um, are to start two, and I asked uh, our panelists to speak for about five minutes about both of them, and then we'll continue the discussion among them. The first question is about whether it's a good idea to push more work on theory, um, theory comparing uh, large language models or other deep learning models and human intelligence and comparing large language models among them. Um, we are, because we are at this uh, unique point in the history of mankind in which we, you can argue that we have more than one intelligence around, uh, more than human intelligence. And so I think it would be very interesting to see whether there are or not common principles of intelligence, common to these different forms of intelligence. Um, and the second question is one that has been at the core throughout uh, this workshop and is uh, essentially whether uh, neuroscience can help AI and AI can help neuroscience. So, uh, you know, to give you an, a small idea of the kind of fundamental principles I'm thinking of about uh, uh, deep learning and human learning is uh, a question like, uh, related to puzzles existing at this point. The main one being, um, as you know, there is a curse of dimensionality. If you want to uh, compute a function, do a computation that requires uh, more than a few inputs, um, you incur in this problem that you potentially need an exponential number of parameters to do a good job in uh, uh, representing the kind of computation that you want, the kind of function you want. And, but apparently neural networks are not um, really subject to this curse. The question is why and whether this gives us some insights about, about them and uh, potentially other forms of intelligence. Um, okay, and there are other questions related to that. Um, having to do with the difference between classical and quantum computers, but we'll discuss that later. Um, so the first, uh, I would like to ask uh, Jeff. Uh, I think Jeff is, uh, um, apart from me, maybe the oldest in the group. Uh, I met Jeff for the first time, I think it was 79, Jeff, in La Jolla. Do you yes. remember? With Yep, I remember it. Right, so we're old enough. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, so that's uh, you know, a, good, a good argument for having you start this discussion. OK, so taking into account age is the only thing I've got going for me. Um, <laughs> I am going to ignore the question about theory. I don't do theory. My math isn't good enough. So I'll just focus on the other two questions, the role of neuroscience in AI and the role of AI in neuroscience. <laughs> um, I think neuroscience has clearly had a huge impact on AI. Just the idea that big networks of simple processes that learn by changing the connection strengths, um, that's con the idea that they can do really complicated things, that's not initially very plausible. Um, and 
it's because of neuroscience that people explore neural nets at all. So that's the main influence. Um, there is lots of little things like ideas like dropout um, came from thinking about neurons and how neurons occasionally don't spike when they should. Um, ideas like relus came from both Sam Roice and Hugh Wilson telling me that sigmoids really weren't very good models of neurons. That, uh, Relu was a much better model of a neuron. Um, even though sigmo logistic sigmoids have very nice Bayesian interpretation, but they don't work as well as Relu's. Um, one other influence that I think hasn't happened yet and needs to happen, and it hasn't happened for hardware reasons, is fast weights. So here you will be very familiar with the idea that you can actually implement fast weights, um, but it doesn't buy you much because you can't do your matrix matrix multiplies anymore because every case has different fast weights. So you can't share the weight matrix between different cases. Um, I think maybe people will eventually start using fast weights when they have different hardware, where maybe weights are conductances. Um, so that's something that's yet to come. But I had an epiphany um, recently, this spring, I was sort of thinking about analog computation and how to make things more energy efficient. And I suddenly realized that maybe these digital intelligences we've got that use backprop, where you can make many copies of the same model that behave identically, um, maybe they're actually better than what we've got. They're still a bit smaller than what we've got, but not that much smaller. Um, they can pack a lot more knowledge into a lot fewer weights. And um, my current belief is they're probably just a better form of intelligence. It couldn't evolve because it's so energy intensive. It needed us to create it. Um, but my current belief is that, um, so this switches to the other question of the, the role AI for neuroscience, that new developments in AI may not be telling us much about neuroscience. It may be we've got most of the information, inspiration we could from the brain and now the new developments um, don't necessarily tell us much about the brain. That's a radically new thought for me. For 50 years, I thought that if you made your AI a bit more like the brain, it would work a bit better. And I no longer really believe that. Um, one other thing I think AI has told us is that um, these big language models, or big multimodal models especially, have undermined the kind of argument that the brain is more statistically efficient than artificial neural nets. And I think what they've shown is that people previously were comparing um, what an MIT undergraduate can learn from not much data with what a tabula rasa neural net can learn from not much data. And if you take a large language model and you could pit the large language model against the MIT undergraduate on some new task, there's not nearly so much difference in statistical efficiency. This is the few shot learning. Um, so I think AI has taught us something about why we're statistically efficient. And um, I think Bayes said it rather a long time ago, that we have a very, very rich prior. And But there's no reason why digital intelligences can't have a similarly rich prior. And I think I've used up my five minutes. So... Uh, Pietro. Pietro Perona is a professor at Caltech, is renowned for his pioneering contribution to computer vision and computational neuroscience. He has played a key role in advancing object recognition, texture analysis, and vision science research. This is, by the way, written by ChatGPT. So. <laughs> <laughs> so it's slightly bombastic, but okay. Um, and yet shaped the future of vision technology, also engaging with the next generation of researchers, such as uh, Fei Fei Li. And I think you are VP or something at Amazon in your spare time, correct? I, no, not VP, my title is Amazon Fellow, and I spend half time there okay. at the moment, uh, mostly working on responsible AI at Amazon. So hi, uh, Jeff, hi, Demis, hi, Ilya. Um, okay, so I'm, I don't have uh, prepared comments because I was asked at the last moment, but I can say a few things. Um, so something I notice is there is a debate going on on uh, embodied intelligence versus intelligence that you can 
derive from purely reading um, text. And so I'm in the camp that thinks that at least part of the things we know how to do have to come from having a body. And in general, intelligence will be different if you're embodied or not. Right now, we have been <clears throat> over-indexing for you know, very good reasons on the intelligence we can get out of analyzing batches of data that is available on the internet. But in time, we want to have intelligent machines out there that act in the world. And so we know about um, uh, Mark Rayburn's robots. We've seen them. We know about cars that have to drive on the freeway and don't yet have a good theory of mind of other drivers. And so they don't interact well with, with the rest of the world. Now, if we want to go there, uh, then some of our perspective on how to do intelligence will change. Right now, we are poisoned by correlations. and. We don't uh, know how to build machines that can understand causation. And to understand causation, fundamentally, you've got to allow the machines to carry out experiments. And, um, uh, and so why so? Well, because um, if you're a non-embodied agent, well, prediction is all you, what you, all you need to do. And, and correlations are very good for prediction. But if you need to change the world, and so you need to do intervention, then you need to understand the causes of things, and then causation is fundamental, being able to reason about that. And so we haven't yet seen um, artificial systems that uh, carry out experiments and design them at the same level, even close to what humans can do. I've seen machines built by my students that can beat any naturalist at recognizing plants and animals. You can carry in your pocket iNaturalist and recognize about 100,000 species of plants and animals. But it, no machine comes even close to a, a, a lousy biologist in thinking about how to carry out an experiment, interpret the results, etc. So that's terra incognita. It's very interesting to me. I think we should think about getting there. Um, so then people wonder about superhuman intelligence. And of course, machines have unfair advantages. They have access to much more information at their fingertips. They can communicate through just batches of parameters, what they learned to another machine, which we cannot do, et cetera, et cetera. So they can use more sensors, more able-bodied if you want. <coughs> so it's clear to me that um, in some domains, at least the machines will do better than we do. And um, another third question that Tommy was asking was about theory. And um, you know, since the, the facts on the ground are changing so fast, um, we have a moving target, and so of course we want to develop theory, but that takes a long time. Uh, sometimes we've seen shreds. I think that uh, Jeff was mentioning, uh, for example, dropouts. So that in my mind, in the, the main, most successful piece of theory for deep networks is how to avoid overfitting and how to do regularization. And so we understand much better how to do it now. So I would say that's a good piece of theory that has come out. Um, and so it will be in the future a mix of this moving target of what people can do. We have to remember that it's about 50,000 very smart people around the world trying things out and see what comes out. You cannot beat that by, by pushing equations. You, have, you know, there's just this massive exploration. And so theoreticians have to pick the most juicy targets and, um, and work there and see if they can keep up. And so we see both theory and uh, experiment. And depending on how things go, the, the one or the other will have a oh. An advantage, and we don't know which one it's going to be. So I think I will stop here. Thank you. So David Siegel. David is a, a co-founder, co-chairman of Two Sigma Investment, a large hedge fund. Um, um, I think uh, we met in what is now the Moderna building, and was the AI lab. And you were a roboticist. And the, in the meantime, you were working in a field of finance that I think is probably the hardest for machine learning. So it would be very interesting to hear your perspective, not only from the point of view of research, but also business, communities, going forward in, in the context of this AI revolution. David. Uh, thank you, uh, Tommy. I, uh, am, I'll touch on that at the end, but let, let's start for a moment by everyone 
relax. We're almost at the end of a wonderful 10-year celebration. Close your eyes for a moment. Go back to your childhood when you're very young. Imagine you're with your parents in a field looking up at the stars. Just try to recreate the thoughts that you might have had back then. Okay. Now hold that thought, and I'll get back to that in a moment. Um, when, when I think about my own journey uh, and why the study of intelligence is important, uh, initially it started, really, by an interest in trying to get computers to do human-like things. And, uh, and that's what brought me to the AI lab. And I wanted to essentially solve practical problems. And today, the field of AI has advanced substantially, and it is able to demonstrate uh, an uncanny ability to, um, to solve various classes of problems. It's, qu it's quite remarkable. We can debate how much thinking it's doing, but you can't debate how, uh, uh, how uh, the results are, are, can be applied to businesses like my own. Uh, it's infusing uh, various kinds of technologies on the internet. That's all quite good. But uh, more recently, though, I began to, and in part joining with Tommy uh, here when he was conceiving CBMM, began, began to ref reflect more on really the notion of intelligence and what, what does it mean and why is it important to think about it. And when you go back to uh, uh, dreaming about the stars long ago, for some of us, um, you were wondering, I believe, uh, given everyone here in the room, what's going on up there? You were not just looking at why are they, you know, how are they moving. You weren't thinking about predicting uh, orbits. You were thinking big picture. Uh, what, this is really a remarkable thing. You're looking at what, what made this be? How does it work? Why is it here? And all of this is really uh, a problem that mankind has studied for almost forever. Uh, uh, so much effort goes into trying to understand our universe, not because we're going to be building some kind of practical device out of it. We're, it you know, an understanding of the universe isn't going to make a better search engine. Uh, we just want it because we want to know why we're here, and this is just part of our existence. Intelligence is the same thing. To understand uh, our mind is a key, key aspect of understanding our own existence. And if we don't understand what our mind is and what intelligence is, we're never going to really know who we are. And to me, this is a basic uh, research project. It's not motivated by commercial gains. Uh, understanding intelligence probably will help advance commercial AI applications, which is wonderful. But that's not why I'm interested in the problem. Uh, no more than the cosmos will not lead, probably, maybe it'll lead to a commercial application, but uh, I doubt most researchers in that area care about that. I wanted to reflect a little bit on the actual question of uh, uh, you know, neuroscience and AI. Well, if you're framing the problem the way I'm trying to frame it, uh, the answer is they have to work together because the problem is to understand, I think the grand problem is to understand you know, a theory of intelligence and how the brain uh, is able to compute in a way that uh, provides intelligence and you know, extend it to consciousness. That makes it too hard to even comprehend. We can stick with intelligence for the time being. This theory of intelligence, it, it's not going to come, in my mind, from uh, experiment purely from just, you know, oh, it looks like it's intelligent. We need to have a deeper understanding to be able to essentially describe what's going on just the same way as to, you know, we could use some model to predict the motion of the stars, but that's not good enough for understanding what's going on. You know, you'll make, that's not, when you were dreaming as a kid, you, you wanted to understand, well, I mean, you didn't know that maybe, but you know, how is gravity working? What's holding the thing together? How did, you needed the theory. So I believe that, that what we should be, you know, everyone doesn't have to work on this, but CBMM, uh, its focus has been largely on what I'm describing, 
it's not meant to be, let's make commercial AI better. I think that's good. There are plenty of people, you have them on, on the screen here, uh, who work on that problem uh, uh, and are doing a great job. I think what we're doing here is much more about what I'm describing. And I think that the, frankly, the amount of uh, money that uh, you know, is invested in this kind of research is unbelievably small <laughs> compared to studying other grand challenges just to help us understand who we are. So the neuroscience part and the AI part, I think, are the best way to develop combining them together to understand you know, this theory of intelligence, the theory of the mind. Um, I'm not sure it will lead to better AI. Uh, perhaps we've gotten all the benefits, as was suggested a few moments ago, perhaps most of the benefits have already been achieved uh, to uh, uh, be inspired, uh, uh, inspiring AI. But uh, to me, that doesn't really matter. And so I, I'll conclude just simply by saying, I think really this is all about understanding who we are. And to do that, we need a theory of intelligence. Could not agree more. <laughs> Very good. So um, now Demis, Demis is the co-founder, CEO of DeepMind Technologies, and m more than that now. And uh, as you all know, has made uh, pioneering achievements in uh, uh, the virtual world of uh, uh, games with AlphaGo, AlphaZero, and more recently uh, in the world of science with AlphaFold. He received the Lasker Prize recently. Congratulations, Demis. And um, <laughs> uh, you probably did not receive it yet, right, officially? Uh, yeah, no, a couple of weeks ago. It's, it was it was a but great ceremony. What Thank was you. That? Okay, yep. So, um, and before that, he was a, a game designer, but uh, essentially a neuroscientist with a PhD in neuroscience at University College. Um, which I find it's a very interesting fact that uh, um, you're heading arguably one of the best uh, AI companies and another one, uh, Google, and uh, you're a neuroscientist, not a computer scientist. So, Demis, up to you. Thanks, Tommy. Um, so, I, I, I just want to... Um... You know, actually, uh, Jeff said a lot of the things I was I was I was planning to say, and I agree a lot with um, uh, Jeff's opening remarks. So, um, you know, I think neuroscience has made a huge contribution to AI. It's sort of um, more subtle than just sort of pointing at oh, which algorithm. I think it's just the soup of ideas, not only in deep learning but also in reinforcement learning, um, which I, I think has been important. Um, and other things too, even even smaller ideas like memory replay, um, um, episodic memory, things like that. Uh, the, the the seed of those ideas has come from uh, our understanding of neuroscience. And uh, even if they end up being implemented in a way uh, that's quite different uh, uh, in silico. So I think we shouldn't underestimate that. And I think the neuroscience community should feel very proud of that. Um, but we are moving into a new era now, I think, um, where it's now becoming very engineering heavy what we do um, in, in, in the, at the cutting edge of AI. And the systems are increasingly sort of diverging from maybe what um, how the brain works. Um, so I, I came to that realization maybe, you know, probably four or five years ago. Um, as the sort of the scaling laws seem to start holding with these, um, what have become now the, the frontier sort of large language models. And in fact, they're not just language anymore, but multimodal. Um, now, having said that, I still think there are missing things with the current systems. Um, but if we were having, and, and we've had these discussions over many years, over the last decade, and if we were to be talking five years ago or something, I, I think I would have made arguments about how are we going to, how are these systems going to learn abstract concepts or form abstract conceptual knowledge, including eventually symbolic knowledge like language? Maybe we would um, be discussing about grounding in the real world um, through embodied intelligence or simulations. And it just turns out there is this other way to do it, but probably because, um, you know, it's a little bit, I, I, I regard a bit like the Industrial Revolution where 
you know, there was all these amazing new ideas about energy and, and power and so on. Um, but it was fueled by the fact that there were dead dinosaurs in the ground, right? And, and coal and oil and just lying in the ground. Imagine how, how much harder industrial revolution would have been uh, without that. Um, we would have had to sort of jump to nuclear or solar somehow in, in one go. And, and, and I think that's what's happened with intelligence research and AI research. And, and the equivalent of that oil is, is just the Internet, this massive uh, human cur curated artifact that we've been building over the last 20, 30 years, the whole of humanity has been building. And, um, and of course, we can draw on that. And there's just a lot more information there, I think it turns out, than any of us could can comprehend, really. Uh, and that's what these um, massively scaled AI systems are able to draw on. So I think that allows us to, uh, along with some human feedback, by the way, the reinforcement learning human feedback, which I think some grounding seeps through that, in effect, because we're obviously grounded agents. We're interacting with these AI systems. Um, perhaps they're ungrounded, but then they get grounded feedback, right? So um, effectively, there's some grounding, I think, uh, seeping into their uh, 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 their knowledge and and their and their behavior through through that uh, um, through that approach. Now, you know, so there's so there's still things I think that are missing. Um, I think we need we're not good at planning. We need um, to fix factuality. Um, I also think there's room for like memory and episodic memory. So I think there's still a lot of room for inspiration to come from perhaps neuroscience ideas. But perhaps the peak of that has 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 passed now. On the other hand, what I do think uh, we should be taking from neuroscience is analysis techniques. So I think that's what I would, um, and I've talked to Tommy about this, this is what I'd pitch CBMM on, is that we, we're really lacking in our understanding of these systems. They're incre it's incredibly hard to do because it's an AI is an engineering science. You have to build the artifact first, which is already very hard, before you can then decompose it scientifically and understand it. And that's a moving target, obviously. So um, it's a very empirical science, and I think we need an empirical approach um, as well as theory, but, empir but largely empirical approach to trying to understand uh, what these systems are doing. And I think that neuroscience techniques and neuroscientists can bring to bear their an analysis uh, uh, skills to this. So the kind of work I have in mind is things like Chris Oler's uh, work at Anthropic, I think some of the best examples of this, of an analyzing uh, what these systems are doing and the representations and the architectures and so on. But I just need, I think we need like 100x more research on that. Um, so, you know, that, that's that got to be the goal. I think the other thing that the, the um, places like CBMM can do is the leading labs, I think, and including ours, would be willing to give early access and access to these very large models for the purpose of analysis and red teaming. Um, and I think critically, we also need benchmarks to benchmark um, capabilities. So, uh, and that obviously has safety implications as well as um, uh, performance implications. So, you know, for example, like, you, you know, it would be good to know if these systems are capable of deception, but what does that mean? How can we operationalize that in a, in a way that can be tested, rigorously tested and perhaps passed in some, in some sense? So there is a huge amount of work here um, to be done. I think urgent, urgent work to be done that is getting done by some of the leading labs, but but is, there's not enough of it. And I actually think we'd be better if uh, independent uh, academic uh, uh, institutes were to do this and join join that uh, effort. So perhaps I'll end with you know obviously as we as these systems get incredibly powerful um, and and probably very very soon you know it's we, I think we it's an urgent need for us to understand these better. And I mean, there, there may be other possibilities, for example, like these systems explaining themselves um, in addition to us analyzing uh, the representations and things. Um, so I think um, I've got a lot of optimism that we can do this, but it needs a lot more people, a lot more great researchers uh, uh, joining that effort. Thanks. Ila Sutskever, you are the youngest kid on the block the last one to speak. He uh, did the great things with uh, Jeffrey first, uh, with ImageNet, and then uh, he was more recently a co-founder and is uh, uh, chief scientific uh, officer or something like this at OpenAI, and so responsible for ChatGPT and GPT-4. Ila. Thank you for the introduction. <coughs> Lots of Extremely good points were made, but I'll be concise.
So there were three questions being posed. What is the role of theory? How can neuroscience help AI? How can AI help neuroscience? So I'll start with that very quickly. Theory, theory can mean different things to different people. It is unlikely due to the great, due to the very high complexity of neural networks that you'll be able to have very precise theory at the level of where you can make incredibly good predictions like you do with physics. At the same time, theory is obviously useful. And you could see even today that once you give up on the desire to have extremely precise theory, then suddenly a lot of ideas around scaling of parameters, scaling of activation, activations, their normalization, theory of optimization, suddenly all comes together and is obviously extremely useful for AI today. I am completely certain that more theory like this will continue to be useful. So that's the first point. Second, what can neuroscience give to AI? Indeed, it was already mentioned that very important giant ideas have come from neuroscience to AI. For example, the idea of a neuron, the idea of a distributed representation. Many, many of them were mentioned before by, by Demis, by Jeff right now. And it is possible that there is maybe one or two or three more such big ideas which we can borrow from neuroscience. But it takes great skill and incredible taste to borrow ideas from neuroscience successfully. The brain is immensely complex and neuroscience produced an incredible, an incredibly giant set of facts about the brain, about neurons, about their spikes and about their ion channels, maybe about the larger scale organization of the brain. And it is not at all obvious which of those ideas are incidental and that you should not worry about them versus whether there is one particular idea in the brain that we perhaps can use as inspiration for our research. So I think it is possible that we will find in some small number of years that something that you've discovered has an analog in the brain or perhaps that the inspiration will go from the brain to our AI systems but it needs to be done carefully. And I would not say, oh yeah, just go look at the brain and copy it. So that's the second point. AI helping neuroscience. One very interesting thing, and it would be very, very amazing if it turned out to be true, is that there's this mounting evidence that the representation is learned by artificial neural network and that the representation is learned by the brain, both in vision and in language processing are showing more similarities than perhaps one would expect. I don't think this is something that was immediately obvious in advance. So maybe we will find that indeed by studying these amazing neural networks that everyone is producing right now, it will be possible to learn more about how the human brain works. That seems quite likely to me. I think it's fruitful. I also want to echo, I want to also, um, echo and support Dennis's point around some specific useful things that can be done in academia and in this center, one of which would be the evaluation, understanding what these models can do, how good are they really? You know, it's very confusing. Sometimes you have these models, they show amazing flashes of brilliance on the one side. On the other side, they have these very strange, quite non-human failure modes, getting more insight into what's going on there and even better, Gaining and get, trying to gain an understanding of where things will be, any insight at all about where things will be a year from now or two years from now would be quite helpful, would be a very important contribution to be done outside of the big companies. I'll stop here. So maybe we can sit. Let's try this arrangement with the virtual ones. Um, I wanted to first to to show a couple of slides just to introduce the discussion. Yeah, because our panel, some people in our panel virtually did not hear this yesterday, but this was one reason I spoke about why theory is good. I was making the example of 
Volta discovering the battery and uh, um, the fact that that discovery uh, brought really immediately a revolution even if nobody understood what electricity was. Um, in the 20 years after Volta inv invented a pila, pila means pile of things, which are disks of zinc, cork, and copper. Um, this, this thing here. Um, yeah, and 20 years after that, there were electrical motors, electric generators, electrochemistry was done, telegraph lines. So it was a big revolution, but it's only much later that we had an understanding, a theory of electromagnetism with Maxwell. And of course, this contributed even more to power in the revolution uh, of electricity. It's, you know, 1800, it's not very long ago, 200 years or so. Um, so um, that's why theory, uh, among many other reasons, having to do with, uh, for instance, what um, David mentioned before, and we want to understand ourselves, having a theory is, uh, means understanding what's going on, we would like to have a theory. And uh, um, does not need to be the same level of precision as physics or Maxwell equations. There may be just some fundamental principles. Um, and, and then on the second point that uh, was uh, what uh, Demis and also uh, Ila referred to about what uh, the research program could look like to be a kind of empirical study of different forms of intelligence. So large language models, different ones, possibly comparison with human intelligence. And this would be the level of cognition and the level of what is inside the box. And one of the goal would be to look at um, systematic uh, differences and common properties, common behaviors, common, if there is any, leading ideally to some fundamental principles common to these intelligent systems. Um, there may, may be none. I, I personally believe there would be. And this would be uh, maybe not an understanding in the precise sen sense of classical mechanics, but something equally useful and important. So let's, let's start from here. Who wants to have a, a first uh, um, take on this? Jeff, what about more on the theory? You are, I guess you are on the negative side or neutral. I'm, no, I'm not against theory. I think theory is great. Um, it's just I don't do it. Um, I'm not very good at math and I much prefer doing more practical things. Um, there's something I forgot to mention when I was talking about AI for neuroscience. I think he's made one huge contribution in neuroscience in the last few years, which I think is it's given us a much better understanding of the nature of language in the brain. So there's this crazy guy at MIT called Chomsky, who has been claiming it's all innate. Um, we know now that doesn't have to be the case. And... Chomsky's whole view of language is kind of crazy when you look back on it, because language is about conveying meaning. It's about conveying stuff. And Chomsky kind of ignored that aspect of it. It's as if you wanted to understand what a car is. And for all of us, understanding a car would mean um, a large part of it would be understanding how the engine works that makes it go. Um, but you can imagine someone saying, no, no, the thing about cars is to understand why it is you get three-wheel cars and four-wheel cars, but you never get a five-wheel car. And that's what we need to understand about cars. And that seems to me like Chomsky's theory of language. He wanted to understand why certain syntactic constru constructions aren't possible. And as far as I can see, he did everything he could to avoid the basic issue of how does language mean? Um, so, and I think these large language models have put an end to that. Um, not in Chomsky's mind, but in more or less everybody else's mind. Yeah, just to follow up on that and, and, and also just mention about AI for neuroscience as well. 
Well, for what it's worth, Jeff, I've always thought Chomsky was was completely wrong from my undergraduate days. Just, and I think sent natural language processing down the wrong route for a long time. But maybe that's for another day, that discussion. But um, AI for neuroscience, I forgot to add that part. Like, I think maybe that's what should happen now is we have all these amazing AI techniques. And I know many people at MIT are doing this. Let's apply it across the board to, you know, analyzing decoding brain states, all sorts of things, things we used to do 10, 15 years ago, but obviously we have much, much better AI tools now. I feel like the, I mean, I, I'm, I've gone a little bit away from neuroscience the last few years, but my, my feeling of the field is, and maybe people would disagree in the room there, is that we need to start asking better questions on the neuroscience side. I just don't feel I've seen any results or, or that have been really major leaps in like learning theory or representations or maybe I have just haven't seen the papers but um, you know I, I like work from people like Tim Behrens and stuff like that in in Oxford and UCL but I just haven't seen the huge flourishing of that that I, I felt was there maybe 20 years ago when fMRI came in as a new tool and um, maybe there's a chance to do that now if you think of AI the AI you know, systems we're building as new tools, new analysis tools from a neuroscience point of view. It feels like we should be doing different types of experimental neuroscience, perhaps. Um, I mean, that's just a question for the neuroscientists in the room. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I feel like, but then I just want to emphasize again, the evaluations and benchmarks point, in addition to what you listed, uh, Tommy, on your slide, that it's it's really important that some, we, we do that as a field, like create the right benchmarks, which does require theory as well theory of what what is it we're creating the benchmarks to, to to theory of emerging capabilities. I don't think there's any theory of these emergent properties, where they come from, um, how these systems produce those emergent properties. If we had better theories about that, then I think we could build better um, benchmarks and then we would have a better handle of when they might appear. I think my first bullet was about benchmarking or, you know, okay, maybe I'm looking at the common and different features, aspect behaviors. Uh, of machines and humans and between machines, but yes. Anybody, any neuroscientist in the audience want to answer to, to, to Demi's challenge? Jim. So I think some of us have drank that Kool-Aid a while ago that we're using these things as our best predictors of what's going on and then driving experiments from those. That creates new phenomena that we post as benchmarks. What's unclear is how to use those phenomena to then turn the crank again to build a deeper understanding. And, that's, and some of us have also been on the benchmark bank for, for a number of years too, which also is not typical in the field of neuroscience and cognitive science. So it's been hard, hard going, but it's great to hear you guys support both those ideas. And those things take dollars and money and also a change in mindset, I think, of how experiments are done and why they're done, not to necessarily create immediate understanding, but to fuel those pumps. But that next turn of the crank, beyond the experiment and the predictions and where they've, you know, that it doesn't, the, the experimental uh, effort doesn't amend itself towards the incentive structure of the field where a lab is supposed to produce a result and then a deep understanding it. So doing science at scale through platforms like that, I think, is where we need to head. And I hear that in everything you guys are saying. And I think that's a great opportunity for us to treat the AI generators as hypothesis builders and us to shape them into which one is most like the brain, let's track that way. And that requires those benchmarking platforms and those experimental things to run together to make that reality. So I'm, I'm just channeling back what you said, just trying to say I'm, I, I already, I'm on board with that Kool-Aid and I hope more people could be. And if you could help us in some ways, that would be awesome. Thanks. Well, from the start, uh, slightly different direction from what Demis was saying, <clears throat> uh, uh, related though, uh, and you know, earlier today, uh, someone made the point that uh, studying an AI system, uh, a large language you know, transformer architecture that is displaying intelligence, uh, is uh, a lot easier than studying the brain uh, because you can uh, poke around at it, you can get whatever you want and analyze it without uh, much effort. Um, it, it seems to me that uh, uh, you know, the brain is much more complex than a transformer. And uh, you know, if we can't really figure out what's going on in the transformer architectures at a level that is uh, allowing us to say, oh, now we really understand what it's doing, uh, it'll be almost impossible to do it for the brain, which is going to be much more complicated. So I see a benefit of uh, you know, essentially shifting some of the neuroscience work 
to these uh, architectures that are displaying intelligence. So if I could add yeah. my perspective. Um, I think we may be at the moment over-indexing over on language as a, as a field of interest. And we should not forget that humans are just one species out of very many who exhibit intelligence. And a fundamental principle of science is to study a phenomenon in the simplest possible embodiment so that one can get to the bottom of it more quickly and start from the simpler version to understand the principles. And so neuro neuroscience has been doing this. And so we do see elegance about order of 100 neurons. We have fruit fly, order of 100,000. Mouse, order of 100 million. Human, 100 billion. And we should not forget all of these different um, trade-offs between power consumption, performance, adaptability, and view the problem of intelligence in the context of many different species, if not all of them. So that's something that nature science can contribute to keep our attention on different forms of intelligence. It's interesting that different people have very different views about that spectrum. So I was once talking to Steve Pinker, and I asked him, suppose we understood exactly how a rat worked, we understood everything we could possibly want to understand about a rat, would we be more or less than halfway towards understanding human intelligence? And I think most biologists would say you'd be most of the way there. Stephen Pinker said, oh no, you'd be much less than halfway to understanding human intelligence. Yeah. Well, that's a matter of taste, but so we don't know actually. Right? <laughs> once we are once we are there, but it, I I think it's you agree, Jeff, right? That it's worth keeping our attention on all of these different forms and not obsess about humans and language. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Mark. Yeah, I've been wondering if uh, psychophysics should be brought into the discussion in a more direct way. I think everybody's talking about neuroscience as though it. Um, Neuroscience, as though it has to do specifically with uh, you know the physics of neurons and and uh, interconnections and that stuff, but you know the behavior of humans and other animals as reflected in psychophysical experiments, and uh, I think there's an opportunity to get to benchmarks that way that could be applied both to uh, engineered intelligent systems as well as biological systems that would really provide an opportunity to do comparisons without having to go all the way to the neuron or to whatever the description of the computation is. Can, uh, I, can I have the slide for a second? Yeah, I think you know, the first point here, the first bullet, is uh, uh, psychophysics or cognitive science or measure of behavior, benchmarking including. The second one is more like recordings. I think the first one is the more important in these cases. But I wonder what the panel, when they refer to neuroscience, neuro, uh, you know, what they mean. Let's ask them, the, the virtual panel. Hmm. Psychophysics, uh, I, 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 I totally agree, by the way, that psychophysics is actually exactly what we need. And um, we even, uh, maybe we were slightly premature with this, but if, about maybe even almost a decade ago, we had a thing called Psych Lab which is like a virtual test lab for AI systems. And um, I think it's precisely that, the behavioral testing under very rigorous controls is probably um, something we need to push a lot harder on, as opposed to just the, the sort of neural recording equivalent. So I totally agree that psychophysics should be a huge part of it. So one question of clarification. If you look at something like AlexNet, it bases most of its decision it relies a lot on texture. And if you look at these new AI generative models, they rely much less on texture for doing classification. Is that the kind of thing you call psychophysics? Yeah. In, th in that case, yeah, I think we need a lot more of that. But it would be also other things, Jeff, like, like testing like memory situations and setups, mm -hmm. like kind of practical little experiments. Actually, we used to model them on rat experiments originally, but you might have to update them now because our systems are too sophisticated. I think one of the nice things about the fact that these very powerful models exist is that some of the ideas that have been discussed here are about using psychophysics as an inspiration, like we don't need to make a discussion, we can just go and try it. And like, 
very quickly already get some interesting results to discuss. And by V, I don't just mean people in the big labs. I mean, there are powerful open source models now. There is model access, like big labs provide model access for researchers. So we could find out very quickly. So it may be interesting to hear from uh, open uh, AI and, um, and DeepMind, how do you allocate your resources? So you clearly have obvious commercial industrial goals. Uh, and yet, you will not be successful unless you do good work somehow. So, how do you look at your resources between just technology, uh, theory, and um, your science? Um, how do you view that within your companies? Maybe one way to think of it, I don't know if you would agree, but uh, uh, in industry in general, there tends to be more hill climbing where you uh, you know, bet on a particular approach and then you uh, keep improving it. Uh, in academia, uh, there's more uh, jumping around uh, uh, because your academia is constantly being pollinated with new thinkers, with new ideas, uh, and there's no infrastructure really for hill climbing anyway, uh, not, uh, you know, not scaling things up. So this is a, uh, you know, in my mind, a natural division of, of ideation? So <clears throat> the question implied that there is tension between the needs of the product and the needs of research. And there is some sense in which it is true. There is a different sense in which it is a lot less true. And I want to explain the sense in which it is less true. <clears throat> you know, it is pretty obvious that there is a fair bit of competition between the different companies on how well their AI is doing. Which means that if you become a little bit too short-sighted, then next year or in two years, your AI will not be doing as well. And so that creates a lot of desire and simple commercial incentive to continue to improve the AI. Improve doesn't also mean to make it more capable. It also means to make the near-term AIs more safer, as well as to do work on making our longer-term AIs, especially ones that will be smarter than people, and those AIs will be built to, by the way, super intelligent AIs, to make them safe, aligned, and generally positively predisposed to humanity. But how do you do this? How do you work on this long-term research? And there is no easy answer, right? There's basically two answers. You can hire lots of great researchers and give them freedom. This is one approach that can be done. Another approach is if you have correct top-down ideas, you're confident then you could reduce your search space and make progress this way. And that's basically, it's like, how is the philosophy? How are we thinking about how things should be as opposed to merely how they are right now? I think all these things that factor in together to continue to make progress. So, okay. um, may I ask uh, one more question? I'm going to agitate another question. So I want to go back to something that Demis was saying before, which is we need to invest more on testing and understanding how to test, which I, resonates very much with me. I was involved in, in the field of vision with defining problems through benchmarks, and that worked for a while. Now I find that when I think about these um, large vision and language models, it's becoming more and more complicated to define what is the task and then what is the benchmark that we should use to measure it. And so I feel like many of us at the moment don't have a good compass to decide whether what is going on is better or worse than before. And when you, <laughs> when you, th when you think about the life of a scientist in a company or in a university trying to decide if they're doing better or not, they often rely on fairly simple-minded benchmarks that you find in somebody's paper somewhere, and you don't even know if they mean anything. And um, looking at the neuroscience aspect, I think we also have a little bit of that in the sense that we are interested in understanding how the brain works, but many of us in the labs end up with um, very stereotyped preparations where the animal has to perform a task that is even unclear whether it has any ecological meaning for the animal and the animal overlearns it over months, and then we study what the neurons do. And it's very unclear what it does uh, in our perspective of the ecological value of intelligence. And so it feels like in both 
fields, we need to rethink what is intelligent good for, intelligence good for, what is behavior, what are animals or automata trying to achieve, and how to measure, in some ways, the uh, fitness of uh, ecological fitness of these creatures. Uh, so it feels like it's a very rich set of questions that uh, Demis brought up, and I'm wondering if, I don't know, so we know what Demis thinks, but I'm wondering if Jeff and Ilya have um, thoughts on that, whether they agree with what I say, that it's difficult to measure performance. Yeah, so there is no doubt whatsoever that measuring performance is extremely difficult. I want to give some examples. You may have heard claims, those of you who have been in AI, you know, so let's say in the mid 2010s, claims around superhuman performance on vision being achieved. Like at some point, some researchers have achieved superhuman performance on vision, on the ImageNet data set. Well then, but we were obviously not superhuman at this task. How can that be? Well, but it wasn't really too big of a deal because these neural nets, it was, it was a, just an academic project, a, re a research project that some very motivated and passionate individuals were working on. So it didn't matter. Now we have much more sophisticated neural nets. They are being used widely and it is difficult to understand their performance. If you give it, if you take, let's say, any one of these, or any one of the large neural net large language model chatbots that you can find online and you ask them to solve a hard math problem and they solve it. Is it because they reasoned and understood or is it because they saw something somewhat similar or perhaps moderately similar in the training set? And training sets are quite large. And this creates confusion. You may see people posting really excitedly cool examples of behavior. They go viral. Then other people try to do similar things and they fail. It's not to say that our neural nets don't work. They obviously do. But it does say that measurement is genuinely not straightforward. And this is an area where I think there is room for very meaningful conceptual and empirical contributions. One little comment I have. I used to do experiments on GPT-4 before it could look at the web, when I was fairly confident that everything it knew um, happened before January of 2023, um, uh, or was it 22? Um, and so you could, you could log off, log on again, and then ask it a slightly varied version of the question and get a different response. And I didn't think you're going to be able to do that anymore. Um, as soon as anybody talks about doing an experiment, GPT-4 will be able to see discussion on the web about that experiment, is my guess. It's going to be very, very hard to do any kind of systematic experiments. Now. So, Pietro, maybe my thought on this is, look, if it was easy, it had been done already, right? So. It's definitely not easy because all the people on this call and, and uh, well, I've been thinking about this for, you know, we've all been thinking about it 15, 20 years and we, we have a lot of, you know, thousands of researchers and whatever. It's very hard. But my point is, this is the grand, this is this is my pitch for to Tommy of like what my, I believe MIT, this is what I would do if I was at MIT in, in CBMM right now. Don't worry about building this, this sort of compute race of like building the largest models. You can act, I think, most of the leading labs would give you access to the models for analysis and safety work and so on. So assume you have that, right? So you don't need to join that race. What we really need, and what I think you're hearing from everybody on from the leading labs, is this is what this in, and this involves theory, involves um, neuroscience, involves psychophysics, involves practical um, uh, experimentation. Is how are we going to wrestle these questions of emerging properties, um, right benchmarks? Um, testing these new types of intelligences, as Ilya says, like we had, we've all seen this, like in AlphaGo, you know, you have a system it's better than the world champion, but if you get it out of distribution, you can make it do weird things even today. I mean, we could fix that, but, but there's no point for just for Go. But it's just that, they're, 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 you know, these are kind of lumpy intelligences that sort of seem they can have big delta sort of holes in what they know because of the way that they're trained in a way that a human intelligence can't have, right? because of the way that humans learn. So it may even require whole sort of new theories or meta theories of learning um, that we don't have today. I think it's extremely rich space for the next five, 10 years. 
um, which probably plays into the strengths of what MIT and CBMM can do. And I think it's, it's extremely badly needed and, and, and urgently needed. And it's probably complementary to pro what the leading labs are good at. I mean, we try to do a bit of that at Google DeepMind. We do have some neuroscientists. That's pretty unusual already for AI labs. But th there isn't enough that they're not attracted to do that kind of work in those kind of places. So I think this is a big opportunity and it's 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 I think desperately needed if one thinks about um, deploying these systems and the safety of these systems and grappling with that over the next decade as we get closer to you know AGI or human level intelligence. Um, so I, I think there couldn't be a clearer in my view sort of mission or clarion call and in addition that will help of course understand the human mind in many different ways we've discussed today as well. Um, Anyway, I'll stop there. I'll add just quickly on the David. benchmarking problem. I agree with everything that has been said. Benchmarking is extremely difficult in part because uh, even if it's a well-defined problem, so certain problems have a right answer and you can benchmark. But many, many, most problems don't have a right answer. They have, you know, it, it's, it depends on, uh, you know, context, for example, uh, or it depends on, you know, your, uh, uh, we were talking about this early, your philosophical framework is overlaid onto, uh, so there really needs to be some, some, th some thinking on, you know, what we even mean by benchmarking uh, when you're dealing with, uh, uh, you, you, you know, fuzzy outputs. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I don't really know. And e e I would add to that that, um, Benchmarking is really important because, you know, if you decide on your benchmarking function, then people will tune essentially their models to maximize, uh, they should, the, uh, their performance on that. And so if you got the benchmarking function wrong, you could end up uh, building things that aren't, you know, th that are good at the wrong things, so to speak. Very good. There are Many other questions that I want to ask, but before that, let's open to the audience the possibility to ask questions. So let's see, there was uh, um, somebody was the first one. <laughs> well, we'll go randomly. Hello. Jean-Jacques. Uh, yeah, so this has been kind of alluded to before, but maybe let, let me ask this uh, a little more directly. So we've been all raised with the idea of evolution, right? And that particularly the fact that the, you know, the brain evolved from the refinement of sensory motor control, you know, with the, with the, the vignette of the sea squirt, you know, which is this little animal which swims and then fixates itself on a rock and at this point swallows its own brain because it doesn't need, the, the, it doesn't need to do motion anymore. Okay. Uh, so here we are at a strange place now with LLMs, right, where we have language before motion. In a sense, you know, we have conversational uh, agents and so on, but we nowhere, nowhere near to having a robot plumber, let's say. And it's true that, uh, you know, LLMs have, uh, of course, absorbed, uh, as Demis would say, you know, all the knowledge of the internet and so on. But for instance, uh, we are, I am certainly incapable of describing the details of what I'm doing, what I'm manipulating something, you know, what, I'm, what am I sensing, what am I, so this is not something which is easily describable. So are we missing something by having this kind of language before motion behavior? I think it's not entirely true. I mean, maybe Ilya could comment on the Rubik's Cube. Like, I think the analogy that the data that exists is a fossil fuel is great. And that's far this fossil fuel played an important role in making the AI that we have today. And at least for now, at least up until this point, in the past, ro robots were expensive and there wasn't any robotic data. It was expensive, no one could run, train big neural net and run them on robots. So the recipe that's been working today did not apply to robots. Changing very quickly, if you look at some of the advancements in robotics that various labs are producing, it's looking pretty good. I mean, from the, 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 there is really cool work from Google, DeepMind, from recently from the Toyota TTIC, Toyota Technology Institute. They've been training really cool neural nets that control robots like sleep pancakes and stuff like this. And now it's becoming possible. People now believe that it's possible, before they didn't. 
So indeed, it is true that one could argue that perhaps things the AI we have aren't quite as, as complete, certainly not future complete as a robot. But if you look at the advanced progress in robotics, I think in a few years, things will look very, very different than. Yeah. I, I agree with that, Ilya. And I mean, we just released our RTX uh, sort of generalist uh, robot system, and it's you know it's still far from you know anything that's that's generally capable of robotics. But I, I wouldn't hold out that this is different from. I think language was you know was already very hard, and that was doable. And we have other ways to get around it. I think very realistic simulations, uh, physics simulations, uh, and also just. You know, gathering more data from from large robot farms, arm farms. I think there's ways to get around this, and then generalizing from 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 general models and into the robotics domain. I, I don't think it's going to be that hard in the next few years. So I wouldn't over-index on embodied being different, in my opinion. For those of us who sit in the intersectionality of industry and academic work, when we think about how to apply theories into practice to drive innovation and hence lies, blah, 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 in the real world, here are some questions I want to uh, or One question I want to ask is, we all know the importance of framing a question, a problem, right? And we talked about, I think, some of the people who talks about the holes and assumptions, what happened in blind spots. So here's the thing. If you can go back 20 years from um, ago and you look at this AI field, what are potential blind fields potential blind spots back then that you may not perceived of um, that translated to, to today. I think for David, for example, when you started Two Sigma, what were things in your journey when starting this company with using machine technology in a very, very imperfect real world, data imperfection, system dynamics, um, conflicting motivations between different parties? What are some of those blind spots that may in help us as perhaps teaching data and inform and infer how we may look at AI and humans the next 20 years? Uh, uh, you know, just one quick answer to that. <clears throat> if you're essentially learning off of the wrong data or incorrect data, uh, you're, you're going to obviously get, you know, undesirable output. And so if you don't have a theory and you're just, uh, you know, essentially being entirely data-driven, you better be very careful about the data. And, uh, uh, you know, so that uh, I think is a kind of a general lesson uh, to keep in mind when uh, things become very empirical. Yeah, I just wanted to um, sort of ask the panelists from industry how we could push the envelope on really actually bringing large scale psychophysically controlled experimentation and alignment research to the ground here at a place like MIT. So I think it would be no small exaggeration to say that at least in the last five years, what I've observed in this community is the biggest contribution to neuroscience slash AI research has been Facebook's PyTorch models. Um, those tend to be the models that we use in our research. Those We attempt to try and draw experiments across the open source available versions of those models. But I think it would be quite beneficial to be able to do both sort of large-scale experimental grid searches over, for example, psychophysical parameters in an experiment, but also, you know, smaller scale model, model psychophysical searches where we're able to train much smaller models than something like GPT, but would still need to do it at large scale to train many different versions to test many different hypotheses. It's sort of like Hubel and Wiesel were doing a grid search, but on a screen with a little pen and a piece of paper, if we could do that at the scale that industry is training models, we might actually be able to pursue alignment research at a much higher clip. So I'm wondering what the doors to that might be, how you're thinking about that, what resources you might be willing to devote to that, and how you know, we could get that conversation rolling on how to do experimentation at scale with robust controls and checks from academia, but with the resources of industry. Well, look, I mean, I can just give a short answer to that. Look, I, 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 I think the leading labs are willing to, and we're talking to government about this as well, like provide access to the to the models. So, you know, we should just sort of think about that as a starting point, right? And and some of those models can't, there's a whole question about open sourcing, which is a little bit out of scope today, which is to do with, um, obviously, we're, you know, big proponents of open science and, and, and we pu published many, many things in the past that's underpinned a lot of the advances you see today. But um, as these systems become more and more powerful, we have to answer the questions like obvious questions, in my opinion, like bad actor use case, you know, bad actors 
getting hold of um, powerful technology and then repurposing them for, for, for bad ends, right? And bad actors could be individuals or nation states. So one has to have an answer to these questions um, while still obviously keeping the open science flowing. So it's not easy. That's another thing that's incredibly difficult. Otherwise, it would have been solved already. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll briefly comment on this as well. <clears throat> it, it, it is the case that OpenAI, and I believe many other AI labs provide access to their models for academic research, and that's really the answer. You know, large models are expensive, but you can still do a lot of things with them certainly much easier to run let's say psychophysics inspired experimental model compared to human beings or rats or something like this my name is manolis kelis i'm a professor at mit in ai and computer science and my research on genomics computation biology and also a lot of molecular neuroscience so the, the molecular underpinnings of human disease so a lot of us in this meeting have been wondering a lot about the diversity of human neurons and how vulnerability is associated with schizophrenia and uh, you know neurodegeneration, Alzheimer's, etc., are in fact pointing to very specific neuronal mechanisms, very specific subclasses of neurons. And there's a big debate, and today we, we talked a lot about that, about how much does it really matter that we have different types of neurons in the brain? How much should we try to understand the role of this extraordinary diversity of dozens of different types of excitatory and inhibitory neurons, the role of glial cells, et cetera. Is AI, at this point, in your view, completely disconnected from that? Do you think that uh, there's just an evolutionary weird um, you know, byproduct of the way that we had to get to where we are today that led to this extraordinary complexity of the brain? And if we were to start over with just you know, a giant cortex or something, then we would have being just as intelligent. And related to that, I mean, we're talking a lot about sort of embodied intelligence, about the role of emotions, the role of sort of having the convergence of multiple sensory inputs, uh, the ability to memorize, you know, through these engrams, if you wish. So I'm just curious, in your view, is, is sort of human intelligence just only useful for understanding the human? Or could there be some true paradigm shifting capabilities that could emerge from understanding how this bag of noodles has kind of achieved what it takes a factory of energy to achieve in terms of cognition. And of course, you know, the bag of noodles may be left behind, but at what expense in terms of energy? So I'm, I'm curious about sort of that back and forth question that I think was part of Tommy's premise earlier on. My guess is that um, the brain's been highly optimized over a long evolutionary period. Um, so it's, it's got all these different kinds of neurons because it helps to have all these different kinds of neurons, but that it could do pretty well with far fewer types. Um, obviously, it needs several types. So things like layer normalization in the AI models were inspired by inhibition in the brain. Um, so there's a little bit of neural diversity in these AI models that comes from that. Um, but my guess is it's sort of Crick's view, which is that evolution is a tinkerer and it's been tinkering for a long time. And it's come up with all these little tricks that are instantiated in different kinds of neurons. But you probably don't need all of those to get an intelligent system. I have one quick comment on this, which is if we take a trained, a trained neural network, perhaps, perhaps a large trained open source model, we may just already discover lots of interesting neural types. In fact, that is very likely to be the case. So the, the panel is phenomenal. So I would like to ask you, what is your opinion about AI-enabled scientific revolution? Is AI everything? Is, any, is something AI cannot be done? So combine well, AI Dennis with the science, yes. Demis has already shown it can be done. <laughs> yeah, well, look, I, 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 that's, that's been my um, goal and passion from the start. This is why I've worked my whole life on AI is to, you know, exciting moment now where we can apply it to helping us understand the, the, the world and the universe around us. So I think AlphaFold is my uh, uh, calling card for that of, of what we may be able to do. And I hope when we look back on it in 10 years time, it will just be the beginning of a new sort of era of AI enabled biology or AI enabled science. I think right now, the way I think about this is 
looking at all the systems we've built, you know, it, you can boil it down to sort of quite simply, really. I think for, 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 for situations where you've got massive combinatorial search space, and, and, and often there's a lot of things that can be couched like that, maybe material design, chemistry, lots of things in biology. And then there's a solution, there's a, but there's a, there's a solution to that, whether that's like the correct protein fold out of all the possible ways a protein could fold, for example. Um, you've got to find, you know, you, you, need a, you need a model, first of all, of the underlying space so that you can therefore search that, you know, intractable space in a tractable way to find that um, needle in a haystack answer. And, it, it, and AlphaGo is basically, that's what AlphaGo is, right? But in, obviously in the game of Go. Because um, it, it would be impossible to just do the search on its own. You need a model, some kind of reasonable model. It doesn't even have to be that good of 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 Go and the dynamics of Go and the motifs in Go. And it's the same with AlphaFold. So I think um, right now there are many problems in science that I think if you couch it like that could be solved already with existing systems, let alone the next systems that come along that might be able to generate new hypotheses and things like that themselves. I don't think we're at that stage yet. We have to put in the hypotheses and frame the question and 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 um, give it the data and sort of build the model and so on. Um, so that's very much a, a tool right now for human experts to use, which is what we do. But um, uh, and and it's very general. You know, we're applying it to uh, not just biology but chemistry, to um, fusion, uh, plasma containing fusion, and also mathematics and theorem proving. So there's actually, I, I think there's that, it, it, when you start thinking of it in that way, there are a lot of problems in science that could fit uh, that, that, uh, that type of uh, setup. Appropriate problem for what we're talking about today. I, I've always believed that uh, AI will advance uh, uh, rapidly enough that it will actually help us perhaps solve the problem of understanding the brain. And uh, you know, we should really be ap applying this full circle. Yeah, let me take a quick poll among uh, all of the panelists. Um, you know, one question that uh, was underlying what you, um, uh, underneath what you said and what was discussed many times is how original or creative are the latest uh, large language models. Of course, we know that, for instance, AlphaGo did some pretty creative moves when it won uh, its match in South Korea. So that's possible. But to be very concrete, um, do you think the existing models or some, uh, uh, you know, the next uh, GPT-4, say GPT-5 or so, will be able to state an, a new non-trivial mathematical conjecture? I'm not saying proving it. I'm saying stating it. Who, who think it's possible within the next five years? Are you sure that the current model cannot do it? <laughs> I'm not sure, absolutely. Do you know whether it can? <laughs> I mean, let me give you, you, let me, let me give you an example of something creative that GPG-4 can already do, that most people can't do. Um, so we're still trapped in the idea of thinking that logical reasoning is the essence of intelligence. When we know that Not being really, able to see... but some people, well, yeah. We know that being able to see analogies, especially kind of remote analogies, is a very important aspect of intelligence. So I asked GPT-4, um, what has a compost heap got in common with an atom bomb? And GPT-4 nailed it. Most people just say nothing. What did it say? <laughs> um, it started off by saying, they're very different energy scales, so on the face of it, they look to be very different. Um, but then it got into chain reactions and how the rate at which they're generating energy increases. The, their energy increases the rate at which they generate energy. So well, it got the idea of a chain reaction. And the thing yeah. is, it knows about 10,000 times as much as a person. So it's going to be able to see all sorts of analogies that we can't see. Yeah, so my feeling is on this and, you know, starting with things like AlphaGo and obviously today's systems like BARD and GPT, um, you know, it's, it's, they're clearly creative in some sense. Um, like if you look, get them to do poetry, they're pretty amazing poetry now. Uh, we have systems that can create great music, lots of 
things that we would regard as very creative, all the image stuff, text to image stuff. Um, I still think what you're asking, though, Tommy, you know, is not possible, in my opinion. I, I would guess. I mean, I can't we can't categorically say it because I think there's three types. I, I've talked about this before, probably with you and, and maybe even at, at CBMM about I, I think of it as three levels of creativity. And we clearly have the first two. So first is interpolation, just averaging what you've seen to create something, a prototypical new thing, like a new cat from all the cat images you've seen. Right, that's the lowest level of creativity. Then there's extrapolation, which is, I think, where we're at. So that's like move 37 with AlphaGo, new Go strategies, new pieces of music, new pieces of poetry, new and spotting analogies between things you couldn't spot as a human. Um, and I think we, these systems can definitely do that. But then there's a third level, which I call like invention or out of the box thinking. And that would be the equivalent of Al 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 AlphaGo inventing Go, not coming up with a Go, good Go move, but inventing Go or inventing chess, right? And they can't do that. Something that's as good that we as human sort of game aficionados would regard as as classically good, you know, in some some aesthetic way, right? As good. And and they can't, right? And so um, that's the thing that's missing or Picasso coming up with cubism or a great mathematician coming up with new conjecture. But I I, I don't believe that it's magic. I think that we, we will have systems that can do that. Um, but I don't think they can do that today. And there's something missing still, um, and and and. Uh, but I think we we'll, we will we'll, we will we'll be able to do that in future. So I agree with Demis. Uh, what about Ila? Do you agree or? I mean, I think that the neural networks that exist today are clearly and unquestionably creative. They are not as creative as the most creative humans in history in all areas. So I think that would be a truth. Yeah. I was asking about mathematics in Prague. But... <laughs> well, like conjecture is a bit tricky, right? You, well, like, but you, you know, can it, goes, get... it goes to exactly to what Demi said. Can you invent group theory from, you know, or something? That's different equivalent. from a conjecture, I would just say. Group theory is a little bit, uh, it's, it's a pretty, bit, pretty high bar we're talking about here. <laughs> Not, literally, nothing else will remain after. I, I think a lot of this goes back to the benchmarking. Uh, uh, question. <clears throat> uh, you know, even on creativity, uh, you know, how do you benchmark it? Uh, it, it and I, uh, I, so I would say that one of the things that uh, I struggle with is, um, uh, you know, without benchmark, computers forever have been able to outperform humans, uh, you know, from almost the moment they were invented in certain tasks, uh, and so to to really understand what's going on here, and you know, I'm not disagreeing with anything being said, but we, we really should focus uh, on the benchmarking problem, as Demis and others have pointed out. Just a historical comment. I've lived through a long period of time when I've seen people say, neural nets will never be able to do X. Um, the collective works of Gary Marcus is a nice history of that. Um, <laughs> so I don't believe those statements anymore because um, for all, almost all the things people have said, they can now do them. And people, you know, proving a mathematical theorem used to be something, well, neural networks will never do that. Um, and people just keep moving the, the task, making it harder and harder. And I completely agree with Demis. There's no reason to believe there's anything that people can do that they can't do. Um, it, we may not be able to come up with, they may not be able to come up with profound new mathematical conjectures yet. But that doesn't mean they won't be able to in 20 years' time. But we agree about that. You know, we have a proof of existence. The brain is a neural network, so. Yeah, I mean, unless there's something non-computable going on in the brain, yeah, right? And exactly. Yeah. So, I mean, very clever ones, maybe, or very sophisticated or yeah. very evolved ones. Yeah. Now, my question end, yeah. was about existing, the yeah. existing paradigm, some transformer or lar large language models. And, yeah. Even starting from this, um, not sure whether I'm invading some proprietary area here, but do you have any idea what the next architecture after Transformers could be? <laughs> Jeff, <laughs> Jeff, you must have some idea. Um, if I did have an idea, I wouldn't say it in public until I had <laughs> a <course>. publication. <laughs> Uh, 
Well, at least until I had a grad student working on it. <laughs> Pietro, any idea? No. <laughs> Ila? No. Yes, but you cannot speak about it, I understand. <laughs> 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 All right. So, um, <laughs> So let me move to neuroscience. <laughs> um, you know, I think uh, the question is, what would be a breakthrough in neuroscience that would be a big impact on uh, machine learning? And I think uh, if we could know more about how learning is done in the brain, whether it's done by backpropagation or something else, what this something else is, that would be great. I think. Uh, you know, one of the uh, uh, most uh, dramatic uh, um, agent in the explosive progress of neural networks has been backpropagation and gradient descent. Um, so, you know, it, the question is if that, like many people think, it's uh, unlikely to be biologically plausible, I think it would be quite interesting to know how the brain does it. and that may have the potential to have an impact on uh, AI as well. Uh, but you may think uh, that the, there are other potential breakthrough in uh, neuroscience that may have an impact in machine learning. If you, if you have any idea? Please. Well, I think, it's, I think it's fairly clear that the brain isn't going to be doing back propagation through time. Um, Sorry. That seems very unlikely. All the theories of how the brain does backpropagation that I know of are for doing backpropagation through multiple cortical areas. Um, it's also fairly clear that these big language models, and the multimodal ones too, are storing far more information per connection than the brain. Now, it may just be because they've got far more experience, and we will be able to get much more if we have much more experience. But I suspect now, I've always thought the brain must be doing some form of backpropagation, but I now suspect it may be doing something dumber. But if I could get one question answered by GPT-20, it would be, um, does the brain implement some form of backpropagation? This was great. Thank you all. Thanks. Thanks, everyone.